Hi, everybody, and welcome to the talk today. We're going to be talking about malware awareness and training. And I'll get straight into it uh, with a, a, just a fun slide, really, of who am I? What am I doing here? Why, why am I talking? So I'm Alex Cameron. I work in industry and I study a part-time PhD at the University of Gloucestershire specializing in cyber and technical computing. And those are the areas that I'm, I've really been interested in. Uh, I won't go too far into myself because we already had a, a brief spiel about sort of what I'm interested in and how I ended up in cyber. It's really been an area that's interested me and it's something that I've always had a, a real passion for. So in the talk today, we will talk about a quick refresher on malware for the, the uninitiated amongst you. We're gonna go on an adventure of malware. We'll then talk around modern malware and how that stacks up. We can then go through the, the problems with current levels of awareness of malware and what that looks like really, and then some proposed methods that we can use to enhance that level of awareness and enhance that level of training. We can then look at how that malware stacks up against those forms of training, and then who can actually benefit from this training. So that's sort of a brief synopsis, and let's crack on into it. So I should pull out my phone too, so I've got a little clock, so I know time. Great. So we'll do a quick Malware 101 crash course. So what is malware? Um, for the purposes of this talk, malware can really be thought of as software that you didn't install, that isn't doing something you want, and is probably doing something that are against whatever your aims and objectives are. So everybody familiar with malware at sort of a high level encountered it? Well, hopefully not encountered it, but maybe aware of it. We'll say that. That sounds better, doesn't it? So it's been around since the 1970s in some form or another. You've got the really old school Morris worm, for those of you that remember that, not me, quite frankly, far before my time. <laughs> but um, you've got examples like that, Christmas tree virus, which sends things around via email. You know, fairly innocuous little tidbits and, and programs, really, that would be more of an irritation than a real problem. But unfortunately, things have, have moved on since then, and we no longer really get emails with Christmas trees or small Morris worms moving around. We usually get something much worse. So here are some of the types of malware that I'll talk about. So I won't read the, the full slide, but as you can see, the, the point I'm trying to make is malware isn't just one thing. You hear malware, you think, okay, it's, it's, it's malware, it's malicious, but what does that actually look like? Well, malware has various different actual components within it. So you can have Trojans, crypto miners, botnets, viruses. You can really, it's, it's a huge variety and they all do slightly different things. And it's really designed and developed by the people behind the malware in terms of what they're trying to achieve and what they're trying to get out of you or their willing victim in this case, or unwilling. So you can see there the real variety. You've got some that are on about encrypting files, some want data, some just want your computer to mine currency, really. So it really depends on what that attacker wants in terms of what malware you're going to be hit by and what they do. So those are some key examples of malware types. And then a good one from the past five years. Hopefully you recognize this, but only from news articles, hopefully not from computer screens. So. This is quite a nasty piece of work. This is uh, WannaCrypta. It is the application that would show up when you're encrypted with WannaCry on your machine. And it really took over a good chunk of the world in 2017. So I won't go too much into the technical weeds on it, but it leveraged what's called a zero day vulnerability inside of the SMB system on Microsoft Windows. And in layman speak, <clears throat> what that means is, it took advantage of a code weakness that nobody had seen before. It was completely new to the, to the world. Nobody had seen it. Microsoft hadn't patched it at the time it was released, which is really what led to this. And what that exploit allowed it to do is it allowed files to be copied, migrated over a network and executed, which is really how the, um, the WannaCry virus, well, or malware spread. So you could have a, a version of WannaCry and it would worm across a network. It would find this vulnerability, it would scan for other computers, and then if it found they were vulnerable, it would actually replicate this over to that machine. And here's where the, the previous thing I was talking about comes into this, where we're talking about different types of malware. Here's really where the boundaries blur. So WannaCry is, is kind of a Frankenstein combination of this. It's a ransomware, but it's also a worm. 
it spreads across networks, but that isn't its main objective. It spreads across networks to then encrypt files, to then spread across networks to encrypt files. So not only does it spread, which then causes infrastructure-based damage, you know, if you imagine this spreading once or twice, not that bad, but you imagine this hundreds of thousands of times around the world, it would quickly clog up networks and become a real problem. But then that's not only what it's doing, not only is it spreading and clogging up networks, when it actually gets onto a machine, it's encrypting all of your data. So what that means really is it's taking, it's taking your data, it's generating a key, it's encrypted your data with that key, and it's then sent that key to the threat actors behind WannaCry. And then the key is then erased from your machine, which leaves you with a bunch of encrypted files that would take you, um, how do I put this? It would take longer than, uh, it would take, if you imagine every year is a grain of sand and you look at a desert, it would take you longer than that. So to get your files back without it, which is really where this comes in and is really where the ransomware component comes in. They really say that if you want that key back from them, you've got to pay them. And then once you pay them, they will release that key to you. And if you tamper with it in the meantime, in any way, shape or form, they will delete the key from their server, which means your files are null and void, and inaccessible. And this is really, really bad. <laughs> But not only is it really bad, it's even worse if you're a huge organization. And some things like WannaCry can really rip through. I mean, the key example there is this actually affected large portions of the National Health Service. And it led some services, uh, as you can Google online, really, from various different reput reputable news sources. It led various NHS uh, clinics to, and hospitals to actually resort to pen and paper because their computers were just that inaccessible. It took down various different pieces of machinery, office machines, everything really. So it was a real, real pain. And that's, that's really WannaCry. It's also worth noting as well, the actual method of how you deliver payment to them. So, and this is a key thing as well, attackers behind this, they're not just stupid. The people behind this are well-organized, um, well-resourced and fairly intelligent in their form. Of what they're doing here so you can see in terms of payment they're actually using a bitcoin address anybody heard of bitcoin yeah okay nods so bitcoin i won't go into it at a high level but for the purposes of this we can basically think about this as saying they are using a fairly anonymous form of payment they're not giving you a debit card or a bank account number and sort code they're deliberately trying to obfuscate where the money is coming to and coming from such that you cannot send this to law enforcement and get them to come and help you really so not only are they worming around networks and clogging things up they're also encrypting everything as they go and then they're actually making money off of it too so you can really see how this is uh, a key piece of malware that's across multiple different types of business model. They're not just trying to cause damage. They're actually trying to generate money off of the damage that they're causing. So it's a really great example. Well, really terrible example, but a great example of malware in the past year. Well, five years. And this is another point as well. This is malware from 2017. Malware's moved on since then, and it only gets worse. So as an example of malware in the modern world, TrickBot is a key example. TrickBot has been around in various different shapes and sizes since before WannaCry, but it's really taken on new life in the time since 2017. So TrickBot is particularly nasty because it again blurs the boundaries between what, a, what, an, invi what an individual piece of malware is. It's no longer just a Trojan, just a virus, just ransomware, it's everything. So TrickBot, uh, is composed of different modules, which means that the core malware itself is the bit on your machine that allows attackers to communicate with it and send it commands. But that then means that what you actually get infected with might not be what actually does the damage because it's modular. So the inventors of TrickBot and the operators of TrickBot actually have several different nasty components we can see here that can be really suited to every individual for a bespoke infection experience. So you can look at an individual, well, TrickBot can, and they can decide what they want to do. They can say, okay, we've got an IP address for this. Let's Google the IP address. Let's run a reverse DNS against it, which is a way of looking up any particular domains associated with an IP address. Domains, I'm thinking URLs. So you could potentially work out if an organization is involved through an IP address by running this type of search. If they're an organization, you could then look at this and think, okay, we could data, we could exfiltrate some data from them. We might be able to do some bank theft. We could install crypto mining on their servers. And you can really see how this becomes a huge issue because malware is no longer just one thing. It can be absolutely anything. And once you're infected with the key part of it, 
what you're then subsequently infected with or what is delivered to you through that opening could be absolutely anything. You don't really know what you're being hit with until it's too late and until it's served to you. So that is a, uh, that's an optimistic <laughs> look of TrickBot really. And in terms of some of the different capabilities it can use, as you can see on the slide there, uh, law enforcement do try their best to take out TrickBot, but due to the nature of the internet really, by the time you take down one server, attackers can stand up another. They've got the code, they can just recompile the code on another machine, set up some new command and control servers, and they're up and away really. So it's just a, an ever increasing game of whack-a-mole and cat and mouse. And this is really the case with a lot of threat actors and malware really, and just continuing this back and forth between attackers and defenders. So we're gonna delve into a live sample of TrickBot, not on this machine, just some PowerPoint pictures of what it does, and I'll go through some kill chains for it. But before I do that, I'm gonna go through, what is a kill chain? Sounds quite threatening and ominous. Anybody familiar with kill chains? I see a couple of nods. Anyone wanna have a guess about what a kill chain is based on what's, what's sort of here? What, what does a kill chain make you think really? No need to do hands, feel free to shout. Bang on, bang on, absolutely, it's, it's exactly that. You can think about this, and it's slightly different for different things, but if you think about this as robbing a bank and you think about this as a criminal looking at a bank, silly example, but just run with me for a minute. Recon, you're looking around the building, you're looking for weak areas, you're looking for open windows, damaged CCTV cameras, things that are wrong that would let you in or things that would enable you to better do things and get in really. Maybe the bank manager's left his key card on a table or something like that. You get the idea. It's looking around. You're not necessarily doing harm at this stage, but you're scoping out the area and looking for problems. So in the context of malware, this could be scanning a network. You're looking for versions. You're looking for open ports. You're looking for things that can potentially be used later down the line. We then get to weaponization. This is where the banking analogy breaks down a bit, but maybe we can run with it and say, potentially this is where somebody could be looking at, how would I break into the building? What sort of tools and techniques do I need? I can see they've got an open window. Okay, maybe a crowbar to pull that open further. In the malware context here, okay, I can see they've got port 22 open and I can see an SSH banner is sent and I connect to it. What sort of weaponization am I gonna be looking at? I'm gonna be looking at vulnerabilities that impact that particular port and that particular type of malware because it's crucial here that anything can run on any port so just because you hear port 22 it's good to think ssh but it's not a guarantee it's ssh it is just a port that is open anything can run on it so it's always worth checking but in this case we'll run with it and we'll say okay port 22 is open it's an ssh server familiar with open ssh ssh yeah okay a couple of nods so for those that don't this is secure shell it's a, uh, it's a communications medium on Linux uh, where you can connect to a server and tell it to do things remotely, really. Think of it remote desktop without the desktop, more of just command line, just feeding text to it, but you can tell it to do things through it. So in this example, okay, we've identified an open port, we've identified it's SSH. Maybe we found a vulnerability in SSH. Vulnerabilities are widely documented, especially open source ones with CVEs assigned to them. Maybe they're running an SSH server that's two years out of date. There's probably been a good handful of exploits since then. Why don't we take a look at one of those? That's the weaponization stage It's going, okay, what tools am I gonna pick to break in? Then you've got delivery, which is really, how do you actually get the piece of bad stuff to the poor unsuspecting victim? And that is the stage where this this potential exploit would come over. How would we send this exploit to a potential victim? So continuing SSH analogy, maybe we, I've, we've identified a vulnerability, we've identified that. Maybe we then say, we're gonna directly try and connect to that port and we're gonna try and execute that vulnerability. And that's how we're gonna deliver it. We're gonna deliver it directly to them. Exploitation is when it actually works. When your exploit, it's that moment of that split second where your code executes on a victim machine which then immediately leads to installation where your malware can then establish a foothold, which is where it can gain persistence, which is really where it can survive reboots and it becomes a lot harder to remove really. It means that you can't just close the process anymore. It probably has a couple of ways of staying alive after that. There's no, there's no sort of hope of task manager at this point. After that, you have C2, 
Anybody familiar with C2? C2 is command and control. And this is really where, okay, you've gone through recon, weaponization, delivery, exploitation, so on, so on. C2, command and control, is really the sort of phone home part. It's where the malware is installed on the machine and can then send requests back to the attackers. So this is where your malware is no longer something just installed on your machine. It's something that can go back and forth. So your attacker can send information or attack plans to this now infected victim, and that victim can send data back. So it's more of an open communication channel between an attacker and the infected victim. And then action is where, as I was talking about there, an attacker sending commands. Action is when the attacker actually does what they want to do. So this could be the previous slides of TrickBot. It could be them extracting information, starting a crypto miner, things like that. It's where they actually do what they want to do. The other stages are all eventually means to an end of executing something on a target machine, which is really the key part here. So that is kill chains at high level. That's what kill chain looks like. But what does TrickBot look like in this example? So we'll take a look at TrickBot's kill chain specifically for the example I have. So during some of my studies, I came across a sample of TrickBot and I was able to acquire a network capture along with it. So from that network capture, as you can see on there, Recon and weaponization, I have no data on because, quite frankly, we don't know what an attacker is doing in their sort of the shady room on their machine. We can't see that. We can only see what happens when they actually do the attack. Sort of going back to the bank analogy, we, don't, we, can, we can kind of work out recon. Personally, from my example, I didn't really have any recon from there, so I couldn't work it out. That our packet captures I had didn't have any data, but potentially this could be the look of somebody looking for suspicious activity, things to detect, and weaponization is a stage, again, where we don't have data on because we can't see how they're picking their vulnerabilities there and what they're choosing to do. That's entirely in the attackers' minds, heads, and forums, really, which we don't have access to. But the next stages we can see. So what does this really look like? Stage one, in our example, is a unsuspecting victim was sent a file for lack of a better word, they would just send a file. I'll come to the example in a minute. That file, they seem to take about five minutes to peruse the file, figure out what it was about before they enabled some macro functionality. Anybody familiar with macros in sort of Word, Office, PowerPoint? Yeah, macros are great. They're great. They're great to speed up um, commands. Maybe you have a little piece of code you want to run in Excel. Maybe you want Excel to generate you a QR code for every column or something. And so macros are great. You can automate bits, but macros are also great for attackers because mac macros allow attackers to embed potential malicious code into files that people would normally use, which is a real pain because it means that what could be a Word document could also be a virus and there wouldn't really be a way to tell unless you were skilled in this area. So as I've talked about there, the attacker sort of looks around, uh, the victim looks around the file, takes a good look and then eventually enables macros. As you can see there, the actual time of exploitation is about two seconds. It took two seconds for this person to get infected. So as soon as they enabled macros, what actually happened was there was a macro running that downloaded an obfuscated gzip file, which you can think of as a compressed archive for the purposes of this talk. And it actually wasn't a compressed archive. It was an executable that had its magic numbers changed. Magic numbers are the starting, the starting hexadecimal characters of a file. And those are what can basically be used to determine the file type um, with relative accuracy. And in this case, the magic numbers were interpreted as a zip file, whereas in fact, when they were actually passed through the, uh, the Word document, they were actually decrypted into an executable. So it got past firewalls because it looked like a zip. It looked like a zip, it talked like a zip, it walked like a zip. They thought it was a zip, it wasn't a zip. It was actually an executable that was then um, reversed by, the, by that actual Word document. And the Word document actually took that obfuscated zip file and then turned it into an executable through some clever logic that really happened there. And just again, all of this took two seconds. Within two seconds, it was ready to go. And at that point, it could then start installing. It then took about, about, we'll call it three seconds, really, in which it installs additional modules. So in that two seconds, it's done its exploit. It's had a very brief look around, and it's already decided what sort of modules it wants. So this is the key point here. It's, it's so fast. You can pause at delivery, by all means, but once something is on your machine, things can change exceptionally fast. 
And then after that, we can see command and control lasted five minutes where an attacker jumped in and made some changes, really took a look around. And then nothing really happened until three hours later when actual for another three hours, the attacker actually performed some actions, which we'll see in a minute. So I appreciate this is pretty text heavy, a lot of diagrams. So we'll go to a little fun attack diagram here. So you've got your attacker here and you've got your victim over here. So the attacker, what they first did, unbeknownst to the victim, is that attacker had actually compromised an innocent utility service provider. So they'd done this to further their attack and generate some more attack credibility. If something comes from an attacker and you don't recognize them, it's going to look a lot more suspicious. So instead, they look for things to appeal to you and to lull you into a false sense of security. So they go and attack a utility service provider because bills, everybody has them. Why would anything be different? So once they actually attacked that utility service provider, they embedded code into their web servers so that when particular victims downloaded bills, their bills would be modified to include some extra functionality, shall we say. That user then opened one of these extra functionality bills. When they had downloaded that bill, it took them about five minutes to peruse through it. And within that document, we believe that there was some text that asked them to enable macros to see some bills under the guise of a security protection mechanism. So you need to click enable macros for us to show you your bills because it's a new security mechanism we've brought in. So it's a bit of social engineering here too. Anyone heard of social engineering? Yeah, so it's a bit of trying to generate credibility with you. It's we're so secure that you can't actually see this bill until you enable this. It's lulling you into a false sense of security to do it. And then after they've done that, that downloaded macro executes, then downloads that additional file. And then at that point, your victim is just a, just another attacker, really. At that point, that attacker is that victim. You're both the same, really. And that's the key problem. And then going back to the kill chain, this is the action stage where we can see that, again, these attackers, they're not, they're, they're not stupid. These attackers are fairly intelligent people. They're actually doing things in such a way as to deliberately engineer situations in which they can generate the most value. These are tactical attackers. And we can see here that what they're actually doing is they're waiting for the victim to go home. And after that, they're then executing command and control capabilities. Thank you. So what they do is they perform something called an ARP request. Anybody heard of ARP? Address resolution protocol. ARP is used within a network. It's a fairly low level protocol. And what it's basically used in this case, I won't go into the whole ARP protocol, we'll be here in a long time. But what ARP does in this case is it is saying to the network, hello, who is out there? I'm interested in finding neighbors. In this case, potentially it could be used for, I want to connect to other devices, or I need to know some more network context because I'm trying to communicate with an IP address. And this is a standard function on every every TCP IP network. Your phones, your, your, everybody's probably got a phone in their pocket. If you're on Wi-Fi right now, they're probably sending ARP requests. It's nothing to worry about. It's just done as part of the network to find neighbors. And in, if you're trying to communicate, you need to find those neighbors to do that communication. But in this case, that attacker is just saying it because they want to find neighbors on the network for more willing victims. So they send a request and the request is then transmitted to other people on the network who will then respond with their MAC addresses, their IP addresses, and in the case of Windows hosts, potentially some working groups and other fun information that can be used to further an attack. So what the attacker is trying to do here is not only have they got into one victim, they're now trying to get into others. And this is a really, a really key thing here is, again, they are, they're not just staying in one place anymore. They're not just doing one thing. They are immediately scanning the network. They're looking, what else can I get? What else can I grab? And that's, that's a really key thing here. And then it gets worse. So when that attacker continued on doing their attack, what they actually used at some point was VNC. VNC is familiar, uh, quite similar to RDP. Anybody familiar with RDP, Remote Desktop Protocol? Yeah, you've probably seen similar if you use, if you use Microsoft Teams or even uh, the Zoom we're on right now, we're sharing our screen. VNC is a protocol used to screen share and it's used to share screens. And in this case, that attacker deliberately downloaded a VNC module into their malware such that that victim's screen could then be viewed remotely. What we can see on the screen right now is what, as part of my studies, part of what we're able to see, which is they didn't do a particularly good job on the encryption of that VNC traffic for whatever reason. 
potentially a mistake from the attacker's perspective or a technical oversight. But for whatever reason, we were able to uncover the raw VNC data. And this doesn't look that helpful at face value. This is keystrokes and mouse movement. So it's what they are typing on their computer or what they're moving around. And I appreciate it probably doesn't look of value right now. But I would say, can anybody spot anything in there that looks pretty bad? And if you can, feel free to shout. If not, I'm going to highlight it in a minute. But uh, we can do like a where's Wally. But um, I'll give you a minute. We need a countdown clock or something. We can have the whole theme. I'll use the time to get a drink of water, actually. That'd be clever. OK. Did we see anything? Yeah, that's a good one. And that's one I haven't picked for this. Which... Sorry? Yeah, I mean, I'm wearing glasses and my eyesight isn't that great. I don't blame you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're... bang on, bang on. So here, it, here, I'll reveal the ones that I've picked out, the real big ones. So if you can see here, it's like a fun anagram, isn't it? So you can see here, the attacker, what they're actually typing in is edge settings passwords, loggingLive.com and maillive.com. You can see there's a bit of lag. So you can see sort of the mail. The reason is this attacker was probably on a connection with quite high latency. So they probably had a ping. We're talking 200 plus, hence why this is so, so kind of, I don't know what we call it. Laggy, I guess. How, that's why these are so laggy. But what we can point out here, really, is these different domains that they're trying to connect to. So they're looking at edge settings passwords, login livecom, mail livecom. Can anybody guess what the attacker can actually see from this in their end? Bang on. Bang on again. So I'll go to the page, and we can see here. So this is what we can see on the network traffic. This is what the attacker can see on their screen. So what they've actually done is they've typed this and they've gone to Ed Settings Passwords. And in this example, they have listed all of the passwords on that machine. That example here is a picture from my virtual machine. There's nothing on there. So in this case, it's just a dummy example from me. But you can imagine in a real case, this was probably a couple of passwords, quite a few that were saved here. So you've got credit card information. You've got billing information. Uh, loginlive.com is used for Microsoft accounts. So you can really see how this can be used and what this attacker is trying to do. So they've logged in, they've identified what that, um, what that machine is doing. They've asked for its neighbors. They've connected once the actual person that's on the machine has gone home. And now they've actually tried to nick their passwords. So you can see that everything is being done here in such a surreptitious way to try and extract maximum inf information before you can even detect what's going on. So it's a really scary thing. But as scary as it is, we could have done things to prevent this. So obviously, this is an example that I found from my studies. This isn't anything that's actually um, related to anything. It's, it's open source. You can find this packet capture online. I can happily share the link to this packet capture. It's on a couple of very good websites that are fairly public. And you're able to go and download this packet capture if you want to take a look at it yourself. But I would recommend you do it in an isolated way. But all that being said, this could have been prevented. It's really that delivery part, which is really, what if, before we get to the technical solutions, what if that person had looked at that banner and thought, you know what, no, I'm not going to click that. I don't trust that. That looks slightly different to normal. But people don't always receive that sort of training. So everybody's quite aware, as you can see there, phishing emails, we're quite aware of that. Dual extension documents, quite a new one for training. I personally haven't seen any training that's made use of dual extension documents or online document drive-bys for that matter. So uh, dual extension documents, are uh, you could have dot, dot, dot .exe. So it immediately appears like a document, but it's actually an executable or online document drive-by where you're actually using something like uh, Google Docs or Office to actually send uh, malware directly through that, through that document. And you're trying to do that infection that way. And potentially, by looking at those delivery stages, if we had trained people in this, we could potentially have prevented some of this. 
So why, why do we focus on the delivery stage? Why not the technical stages later down the line of the detection? We do both, but prevention is better than cure. You can't expect somebody to fight malware entirely by themselves. Yes, you've got antivirus. Yes, you've got things like that. But wouldn't it be great if we could get in at that point and stop it before it ever gets there, before we need them? Sure, it's not going to work in every situation, but it's worth a try. So that's really what we're trying to do here. And it's also the speed. The speed is so, so fast that when it comes to the later stages, there's really nothing a person can do. It's all up to the machines, antiviruses, and things like that. So the delivery stage is the point at which humans have a decision to make in terms of if they allow the infection to proceed. Not in every case, some malware doesn't actually need user interaction. It can directly happen. But in a fair few cases, there's a delivery stage where a user has to engage in some interaction, really. So we've gone through uh, a quick malware 101, uh, modern malware, WannaCry, TrickBot, kill chains, TrickBot's kill chain, some of the evidence from that. And now we'll look at some of the problems with malware awareness. So cyber attacks are getting worse. They're not getting better. I think the quote there says it all really, and it sort of shows the angle. So sources along the bottom, if you can't see that, that's the UK government cyber breaches survey. And as you can see there, I'll really read it for effect because I think it, it points out a key thing here, which is of the 39% of businesses who identified an attack, the most common threat vector was phishing. Okay, 83%. But of that 39%, around one in five identified more sophisticated, sophisticated attack types, such as denial of service malware or ransomware. So attacks are getting smarter. Attackers are getting smarter. They're no longer just blanketing things. They're deliberately targeting and they're deliberately looking at ways in which they can extract maximum value from their targets. And they're wising up, which is a really worrying trend. Going on to those technical solutions I was talking about, Technical solutions are great. MDR, XDR, SIEM, antivirus, SOAR, logging, IPS, great, great, great. But the problem is really that as much as they are great, if a user has clicked something in the first place, if we could prevent that, we, we would be able to massively reduce infections in the first place before things get to this stage. So in that example I was saying there, if that user hadn't have opened that bill, hadn't have opened that dual extension document, or that drive by download, potentially, we could have stopped this before it ever got to these tools. And then we could have broken that chain before it ever came to these tools in the first place. Another problem is technical solutions are mostly reactive. There's some proactive ones, you know, you've got a lot of heuristic detection now where they can run something in the sandbox and see what it does. But for the purposes of this, most, if a very good chunk of technical solutions are reactive. And the problem is, I, I think those three bullet points say it best, the smaller ones, to actually pre prevent an, an attack, you have to first find that an attack has taken place and you have to have a technical solution to detect it. And that technical solution has to actually respond to the attack it's detected. If any of those steps fail, it doesn't work because you can't respond to what you can't detect. If it doesn't detect a threat, it can't respond. And if it detects a threat but can't respond, it still can't respond. So it's a really key problem. And it, it, it's really summed up by that. You, you can't respond to what you can't detect. So these tools are great. They're absolutely critical and crucial and should absolutely be used. But as another layer of defense, we should also look at people the same way we look at a firewall. We should look at them as something that needs to be secured and we should look at ways to secure them in the same way. We should look at people as vulnerabilities and ways to fix them really. So here's another good example of this really. It's the limited training for malware awareness. So Everybody kind of heard of phishing and phishing training. We're all familiar with that. Don't open unknown files, don't trust strangers, avoid clicking links, these sort of things really. But these are just some of the areas really. If we go outside, and I appreciate a lot of you are cyber students here, so you're gonna have some of this background and especially some of you are doctors and professors, I'm sure you're gonna have even more experience in this and know what I'm getting at here. But there are huge areas outside of this that people aren't being taught about how to make yourself less of a target. What do you do in an attack? How do you isolate your machine? What are the signs of an attack? really key things. They don't need to be hugely technical. We could make this quite short, snappy, and sweet, and really help to train users against this, because it's all well and good telling them how to identify phishing emails. 
But if they're actually registering their emails with every website they come across because they want to stay up to date with every mail list, they're still going to get more phishing emails, which means more opportunity for attackers. And equally, if they keep getting things on their machine, it would probably make sense that we train them in what to do and how to unplug their machine from the network. Going back to the WannaCry example, there was information put out to unplug machines, but this was put out after the infection had taken place. And by that time, it was too late. But if people had this information, maybe they could have thought, ah, blinking, blinking thing on my screen telling me about this. I can enact that training now and I can unplug this to stop the spread or at least to try and limit it in my own way. So it's a really limited training area. The minute green showing current training, orange, red showing just the huge aspect of things outside of it really and what's not covered. And the training that does exist is often out of date. So you might be going through training for phishing or something like that. And it's going to be telling you about things from 10, 15 years ago. We, we are at such a point of technological advancement where things like AWS, cloud, GCP, everything is coming along at such incredible speeds. AI, chat GPT, all of this stuff is coming out of the woodwork everywhere. And it means that what you're being traded against yesterday is probably not going to be as useful today. And it is just that constant technological advancement outmodes things as it goes along. And really, the, the threat actors behind this are benefiting from these technological advancements. It's not just us. The more technologically advanced we get, the more advanced they get as well. So really there, it's key, key summary slide here is we're really sleepwalking into this. You can really see just the, that example there, the downtick in actual people that see cyber as a high priority. You can see the quotes there, that key point of that first quote, the end sentence, I'll spend it when I have it or when I need to. It's a really key point and you, you hear it a lot and it's the case of, okay, you don't want to spend X percent on cyber or you don't want to invest in this okay but when you do get breached the investment you will then subsequently have to make will be 10 to 50x what you would have had to put in in the first place so old analogy shooting yourself in the foot really and you can see how we're just sleepwalking into this this stuff is happening i'm sure you've heard of breaches in the news i mean there's there's constant attacks going on really and it's really important that we address them wherever we can. And this is likely the tip of the iceberg. Everything that I'm talking about is common knowledge. I'm not, I'm talking about everything here is public and open source. So everything I'm showing you is probably a lagging indicator because in reality, where this is being studied and where this is being really looked at, those statistics are probably quite out of date. So really what we're looking at is a snapshot probably in the past and where we're going might be a lot worse than where we are at the minute. So we've now had kind of the, the doom and gloom. We've had what malware looks like, the problems. Here's a potential solution. So simulated attacks and training. So wouldn't it be great if we could take attackers malware and use it against them in the first place? They provide it to us. Why not use it against them in the first place? And this is where training comes in, in terms of malware and simulated attacks. So we can create training specific to what potential attacks people are facing. If people are facing malware attacks, if phishing, if they're facing ransomware, why don't we create training using that malware? You're probably thinking, okay, but what about security? How do we, how, how can we pretend, how can we possibly run malware in a secure way? Well, we isolate it into containers or virtual machines using C groups or actually using an entire hypervisor. And in this way, we can then gamify simulations of malware. We can then say, okay, Here's a piece of malware. Here's a simulated malware attack. Here's what we're going to do about it. And then we can allow users to play it like a game. What more fun is there than a game? I know everybody's fed up with training. If you've ever seen the paper training or anything like that, endless. What about, what sounds more fun really? That or fight off a malware attack in real time? What engages you more? And I know we're a cyber audience, but even examples like this can be taken outside of just cyber ecosystem. And we could say, okay, well, what about we show what a phishing attack looks like to somebody outside of cyber? We could show what a ransomware attack looks like. Even that example I went on about TrickBot there with that, uh, that edge settings password thing, that's something that you wouldn't see in training, but you could see in a simulated attack. And you could now know, okay, right, maybe it'd be worth not putting that inside of edge settings passwords, or at least making sure that I have some security mechanisms on there. And it's tidbits like this that could be really used to strengthen security. And it's things that you could only see through a simulation of what's going on. And then onto that and building upon what I'm saying there, 
you can see how the different types of users could really benefit from this. Going into the cyber industry, you could see this as infection reading, remediation, junior staff training, reverse engineering, sure. But outside of that, technical users, you could see warning signs in network traffic, indicators of compromise. You could see what an attack looks like. You could see key takeaways, like that edge settings pass, which I was talking about there, or things that could be used to prevent an attack. And you could tailor that to the type of skill being taught. Okay, we need some phishing training. Let's have a phishing simulation. Ransomware has been a big topic recently. So have a ransomware simulation. And you can see how this can really be used to actually show people what's going on. Because again, the, another problem is you hear a lot about it, but you don't see it. You don't see what it is, how it works, what it does. And seeing that allows you to better prepare for it. So pros and cons. It's a pretty good sense of realism. It's just like being attacked, except you're not. It's a virtual machine. It aligns pretty well with what a real malware attack looks like in that way. And again, it sounds more exciting, doesn't it? It's probably a little bit more engaging. However, downsides, it's going to be harder to implement this type of training. It's going to be a lot more difficult in terms of technical overhead and how you're going to develop this. And it is the potential for a simulated attack to become a not so simulated one. And this is where security really needs to come into this. I'll come on to that in a bit later. And it would also require significant resources compared to paper training. It's very easy to give somebody a video or give somebody a, a worksheet or something like that or a piece of paper for this, but it's gonna be really, really hard to do it this way. So it's not a replacement at all. This is a, a supplement. So let's talk about some risks, ethics, and mitigations to some of the downsides I said there. So there is always a risk of malware, pseudo malware escaping training. So you shouldn't really be using malware for things like this that isn't already reverse engineered and well known. I wouldn't recommend plugging something completely unknown into this simulation and expecting it to work because on the very small but real chance a virtual machine uh, was containing a piece of malware that had a VM escape vulnerability, you could be in some real trouble. So what I would say is this is an evolving field. It's still being built upon at the minute. It's in its infancy. I wouldn't say run away and start doing this yet, but I would say it's definitely something to be aware of and something to consider and that's really being talked about there through the network isolation, the interaction limiting and things like that as um, real mitigations of those risks. And in terms of the ethical considerations, if we take this forward a bit, we could say, okay, well, if we could train for malware, why don't we buy malware directly? Why don't we buy malware and then run our training on that? Well, no, we, we can't because it's, it's a huge ethical consideration there. We could potentially use it for training, yes, and it could be a valuable source of training, but we shouldn't be funding these people either. So we cannot, absolutely cannot be involved in any of those activities. And equally, any pseudo malware or potentially programs that we've created to deliberately emulate an attack should be marked <coughs> as such. They should contain kill switches to only activate under scenarios that we potentially allow. And these are real key mitigations and ethical considerations here that we need to take a look at. So we've talked about all of this. Now let's talk about TrickBot in our simulated training. As you can see there, here are a couple of examples of how we could simulate some training for it, for those extension documents, document drive, eyes, phishing emails I'm talking about. You can see there, we could do some phishing attack simulation for that phishing email. You've probably seen that in organizations, emails coming along and things like that. But what about dual extension documents? What about a simulation of malware through a convincing dual file extension? And we get a user to pick the difference. We get a user to actually try and figure this out, to hammer home the point of how difficult it is to detect and how to spot the signs of examples of dual extension malware. And then document drive-bys. We could simulate a drive-by and then show users this so they're aware of that behavior. So it's not a silver bullet, but it's a step in the right direction. It doesn't replace anything that's there. It doesn't potentially outmode anything, but it's another supplement. It's another tool in the arsenal for us as defenders to use against attackers. And without being rude, if they're throwing the malware at us, we might as well use it as well while we've got it because they're going to keep throwing it at us and we may as well keep trying to find information from it and use it against them. So as I said there, it doesn't really replace anything, but it's a new, relatively new way of improving awareness and using these simulated attacks to really strengthen that. So that should be the talk for this perspective. And I'm happy to do a lot of questions there. And equally, if you want to give some feedback, feel free to give some feedback from there.